Back in June, we talked about areas without formulas. And in fact, I'm going to continue to talk about areas without formulas in spite of the fact that here what you're seeing is a list of formulas. Okay. What I'd like to get you to realize is that all of these can be reasoned out. And if you understand the reasoning, you don't have to memorize a bunch of messy formulas. This looks very intimidating, and a lot of people just throw up their hands and scream and say, ah, this is terrible stuff. I told you the story about my friend who tiled his kitchen floor and had no idea how to go about finding how many tiles he needed. When you see so many formulas, the whole subject matter looks very complicated. So what I'm going to do is go through this list of shapes one at a time and show that there's actually a sequence, especially those first four. There's a, a pro progression here from rectangles, parallelograms, triangles, and trapezoids. And if you can understand where these formulas come from, then you're on your way to understanding the rest of them. Let's start with a rectangle. Now, when we talked about uh, areas without formulas in June, we said that basically what area means is you have a unit square, and what you're doing is saying how many of these make up one of these. So how many of these little unit squares would it cover? And the bottom line is you count the squares. And so 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. We realize that by the time you start getting to larger uh, arrays of squares like that, it's getting a lot harder to count. And so you'd like to find a shortcut for counting. Well, if you realize there's four squares along one row, and then there's three rows, four times three is 12. And so that's a way to figure out the area of something like this. Take length times width, all right? That gives you the area. Okay, and that's your fundamental area for rectangular shapes. And this is a building block for every other shape we're going to do. Now, if you have a large array like this, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13. 13 times 10 is 130. That's very fast compared to counting the squares. And so there's no question this is the way you want to go. Now, one little detail is, what about when there's fractional squares, like here, three and a half by four and a half? Well, first of all, one, two, three, one, two, three, four. Um, there's 12 squares in the whole numbers. And then over here on the side, here's a half, a half, a half, and a half. There's four halves, five, six, seven halves. Uh, let's just say seven halves, and then there's the little corner, which is a half of a half, which is one-fourth. Okay, well, 12 plus seven halves plus a fourth. Well, what's that? Well, seven halves is three and a half. So let's say 12, and then there's 3.5, let's say, and then a fourth is 0.25. And so this would add up to five, five and two, seven, Five, one, 15.75. Notice if I just multiply, let's bring up the calculator, and let's take four and a half or 4.5 times 3.5, and I get 15.75. So the pattern still holds, but whether it's whole numbers, fractions, or whatever, uh, I haven't really proved it for every possibility, but uh, I've indicated that it works even for a pattern like this. Uh, length times width is going to give the area of a rectangle. Okay. Now, the, what we're going to do from here on out is take the new shapes we come to and transform them into something we already know how to handle. Okay. So, for instance, a parallelogram. It looks like a distorted rectangle, but... Um, the definition of a parallelogram is that you have opposite sides are parallel. So this is parallel to this, this is parallel to this. It turns out opposite sides are also equal. Okay, So there's a lot of properties of a parallelogram, and if you've had geometry, you've gone through some of these. Notice that if I cut off this corner, 
and put it over here. So I basically move this little corner piece over to here. It exactly fits. And now I have a rectangle. And so I want to use the length and width of the rectangle to find the area. But notice that in the original pattern, this was not the width. It has to be a perpendicular, straight up and down um, distance that we want to use for the width of our rectangle. And so we call that the height. And in fact, this distance on a parallelogram we call the base. And so we can uh, say base or just call it B. And so the area of a parallelogram is going to be the base times the height because the base is the length of the corresponding rectangle, the height will become the width of the rectangle. So if you have a parallelogram to work with, let me just take off the excess stuff here for a minute. If I start with this parallelogram and a ruler, you're going to measure one of these sides, but you're not going to measure the second side. You're going to measure straight up and down. So you take one of these times that. By the way, it doesn't matter which of these you take as the base. You can stand it up the other way, like here. And if I took this as the base, then the straight up and down distance here would be the height. So if you were to imagine you're standing up here and you drop a, a rope straight down, that would be your height. Okay. Now what about this? You can't do that cut and paste trick uh, in this situation like you can in this one. But we can do something similar. Let's try this. Let's, let's see, this is three little squares wide. Let's take another three squares here. And if I take this shape right here, and I can tra transform this over to here, and then this little corner piece here fits over here. Okay, let's do both of these with GeoGebra for a little cleaner demonstration. Okay, let's start with this parallelogram. Notice I can change the shape. And if I just take this little corner piece and just move it over to the other side, there's our rectangle. It's a very simple demonstration. So in the original parallelogram, this base here becomes the length of the rectangle. And the height, whether it's uh, this height here, whether it's the height when we cut straight down or any other place along the parallelogram, we can use as the height, and that will give us a rectangle. And so we take length times width again, so the formula would become base times height. Okay, here's a parallelogram that's um, tall and thin, and notice that even though it overlaps, we can slice it into sections so that each of these fits over there. And uh, no matter how we distort this, uh, the same is going to be true. So I can, um, uh, I can shear it different amounts. And notice that it's always going to fit into a rectangle. So the base here is this uh, small end of this parallelogram. And the height is, like I said, if you climb up to the top, think of this as a large object. If you climb over and you hang something over the the precipice down to the ground, that distance there is going to be your height. Okay. Okay, what about a triangle? Well, I'll illustrate it generally here is if you take a triangle and you uh, duplicate it, you just rotate this over here to this uh, to a second piece, we now have a parallelogram. We just learned that the parallelogram is given by the area of the parallelogram is given by the base times the height. And notice that the base of the triangle is equal to the base of the corresponding parallelogram. And the height of the triangle is equal to the height of the corresponding parallelogram. Uh, so it still works. Watch this on GeoGebra. Okay. Notice we can uh, change the triangle to any shape we like. Uh, adjust the size and so forth. And as we rotate it around, I'm just making a copy of the triangle and rotating it uh, to fill in the gap up here. And we now have a parallelogram. And so since you take the base times the height for the parallelogram, you do the same for the triangle, except then you're going to have to divide by two. And that's the key. So the formula is the area for a triangle is one half 
space times the height. Now, I've found students who always get confused. They don't know, is it a base times height or one half the base times the height or what? If you simply remember how we came up with the half, the fact that we use two of these triangles to make a parallelogram, and we find the area of the parallelogram by base times height, we then have to cut it in half to get the area of what we were originally looking for. That's where the half comes from. And if you remember that, then you just look at a triangle, it looks like a half of something, and it's going to be a half base times height. So is it something you have to memorize? Not if you realize where that half came from. You can understand it instead of memorizing it. Okay, the next uh, pattern we want to look at is a trapezoid. And a trapezoid is a four-sided figure where two of these sides here are parallel. Now, it doesn't have to be top and bottom. Uh, typically, when we're looking at trapezoids and talking about them for the first time, we draw them this way. And so I find a lot of times a student wouldn't recognize this is also a trapezoid. But notice it meets the definition. It's a four-sided figure, and two of the sides are parallel. So it's a trapezoid. Okay, so it doesn't matter what orientation it's in. In this case, uh, one of the sides is at right angles, so it looks like we have square corners and one side is off. But still, it's a four-sided figure and two sides are parallel. It's a trapezoid. Okay. Okay, the way we've been finding areas of new objects is to transform them into other things that we already know how to handle finding the area. And there's several different ways of doing this. And so we're going to go through a few of these with GeoGebra. And you really don't need to learn all of them, except just to see that there's more than one way to do it. Pick the one that makes the most sense to you and is easiest for you to, uh, to use to remember where the formula comes from. So you don't really have to memorize a fancy formula. You just sort of go through the process in your head. Okay, here we have three identical trapezoids with a few extra marks thrown in. We'll see about those in a minute. And I can... Uh, adjust all of them. They're all identical, but I can change the shape of this figure. Um, let's look at the first one. And notice if I take the slider, I'm going to make a copy of the original, just like I did with the triangle. I'm going to flip it over and add it on end to end with the original. So now what I have is a parallelogram. Okay. So and notice that the area of the parallelogram is base times height. But then I'm going to have to divide by 2 because the trapezoid is half as big as the, as the parallelogram itself. Also notice that the base of the parallelogram is not the same as the base of the trapezoid. In fact, look where this part here comes from. It comes from up on top. So if we think of the two parallel sides, call one of them B1 for base 1 and call the other one B2. Then if I flip them over, notice the base of the parallelogram is B1 plus B2. The height of the parallelogram is the same as the height of the trapezoid, so we don't have to worry about anything there. So what we're going to do is take the sum of the two bases times the height, and that will give us the area of the parallelogram, which is twice as big as the thing we're looking for. So divide by 2. So the formula, the sum of the bases, times the height, divided by 2. Okay. Here's a second way to see it. Slice it along a diagonal, and you have two triangles. This one is, if you, this was B1 and this up here was B2, recall, this is one half of B1 times the height, this is one half of B2 times the height, and add them up. Okay. And the halves come in because we're talking about triangles instead of having to take half of the finished figure, okay? So it's one half of the sum of the bases times the height, or one half of each of the bases times the height. So B1 times the height, and take half of that. B2 times the height, and take half of that. Now there's a third way that's very handy, I think, and that is to just think of cutting off the corners. So find the midpoints of the two non-parallel sides, and at those points, you cut off the corners and put them up there. And this time, what you have is a rectangle. And the area of the rectangle is the same as the area of the trapezoid. You don't have to divide by 2. Because all I did was put these little corner pieces up into there. 
and that made it into a nice rectangle. Well, what is the length of the rectangle? Well, the length of the rectangle is the length of this, what we call the mid-segment here, that goes connecting this midpoint to this midpoint. And this length here is halfway in between the long base and the short base. So it's really the average of the bases. How do you find the average? You add them up and divide by 2. So I take B1 plus B2 divided by 2, that's the average of the bases, times the height. So this one is nice because it makes it very easy to say and easy to remember, uh, which is simply just take the average of the bases times the height. And as long as you know how to find an average, you're home free. So let's erase some of this clutter. Here it goes. I'm going to label this base B1. It doesn't matter which one you choose to be B1. Label this one B2. And I'm going to average the bases. So I'll have B1 plus B2 divided by 2. And then I multiply that by the height. Or I can think of the other pattern where I doubled up the, the trapezoid to make a parallelogram. And so I take the sum of the bases times the height and then take half of the result. But if you look at it algebraically, these are identical. So the area can be given either way. Okay. And so the way I like to remember it, it's easy to remember, is simply the area is the average of the bases times the height. I know how to take an average. I just say, okay, add them up and divide by 2. That's the average. Multiply it by the height, and we're done. What do we do here? Notice that the parallel sides are the bases. So think of this as B1, and this is B2. And where is the height? It's the perpendicular distance between the bases. And so sometimes words like height, which tend to indicate up and down, can be misleading. Okay, but it's the distance between the bases. The parallel sides we label bases because we usually draw it horizontally like this. But here the bases are vertical and the height is horizontal. But the parallel sides and perpendicular to the parallel sides, those are the things that count. If you just have a ruler, measure that, measure that, average them, times the height. Why do I have this figure here? One of the important applications of trapezoids is when you have a curve of some kind that might be a very complicated curve, and you want to find the area under the curve. Why would you want to do that? Well, this is a process that's frequently done in science classes. Uh, so if you take physics or chemistry or biology, sometimes you're going to want to find the area under a curve. And so one way to do that with a computer is to uh, evaluate the curve at various points. So at, at different points, I pick points along the curve. Then I approximate the curve with little straight line segments. Okay, So like here, if I just take straight line segments to approximate the curve itself, uh, what I have is a bunch of trapezoids that look like this one. That's why I made a special point to mention this. Here I have two vertical uh, sides that are parallel, and the top and bottom sides are not parallel. And so I can take the area of this trapezoid plus the area of this trapezoid and so forth, and I get a very good approximation for the area under the curve. Okay. Now this would be tedious to do by hand, but with a computer, computers are made to do tedious things. They can do repetitive things thousands, even millions of times, uh, very quickly and, as far as you're concerned, easily. Okay, that's what computers are good for. But in order to set them up easily to do that, you need to have something that's systematic. And so this is a very systematic process. You just uh, go from the starting point to the ending point, evaluate the function at these points, and so you get these points on the curve, and approximate them with straight lines and use these areas. And by the time you've added them up, which might be a fraction of a second later, you have the area under the curve using trapezoids.